turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 to 46. Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 to 46. In the last week of Jesus' life, he gets in trouble. He inspires the wrath of the religious elite, the Jewish establishment in Jerusalem. And in his last week before he is executed, they come to him with a question. And the question is, where do you get off? Who do you think you are? By what authority are you doing these things and saying these things? And Jesus actually gives them a threefold answer. The first part of the answer is in Matthew chapter 21, verses 23 to 32. The second part of the answer is in Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 to 46, and that is what we're talking about today. It is part of Jesus' answer to the question of the religionists of just who do you think you are? And here's what he says in Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 to 46. This is what God says. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard and put a wall around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his slaves to the vine growers to receive his produce. The vine growers took his slaves and beat one and killed another and stoned a third. Again, he sent another group of slaves larger than the first, and they did the same thing to them. But afterward, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the vine growers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. They took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? They said to him, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end and will rent out the vineyard to other vine growers who will pay him the proceeds at the proper seasons. Jesus said to them, did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? This became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing the fruit of it. And he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they understood that he was speaking about them. And when they sought to seize him, they feared the people because they considered him to be a prophet. Let's pray. Father, would you send the spirit of Jesus Christ to us now? Would you cause the spirit who gave us this word to make it explode with meaning and power in our hearts? Would you protect your people from wandering away? Would you work now to keep your people close to Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the most precious relationships that I have had in my entire life is with the woman who shared the gospel with me and led me to Christ. Uh, she and her husband became spiritual parents to me. Uh, I love them with all my heart. My kids love them with all their heart. My kids call them Mimi and Grumpy. Uh, we still, almost 30 years later, have a very close relationship. 
She still works at the first church that I served as a pastor. And the last time I was at her house, I saw a picture that filled me with delight and horror. It was a picture taken about 30 years ago, and I was in the picture, but it wasn't just a picture of me. It was, it was a picture of me and the rest of the youth group that I was in at the time. The youth group had taken a trip to somewhere or other to uh, serve Jesus and worship Jesus and grow in Jesus. And there we all were in front of the bus that had driven us to wherever we were. And there was dozens of us in the picture, more than 60. And as we reminisced about the people in the picture and we were talking about, well, where, where is she? What is she doing now? What's, what's he up to? Whatever happened to that family, where are they? It became clear as we looked at this picture full of dozens of people that there were only a very small handful of us that 30 years later were still walking with the Lord. Everybody else in the picture is scattered, has gone away and is doing their own thing. A group of people, dozens of people who paid money and invested time and energy to go on a trip to grow in Jesus and to serve Jesus, almost all of them don't give a rip about Jesus and their life decades later. Now, you know that's not just my youth group. You know that is the story in youth groups and in churches all across the world. This is the, this is the way it works. God does an incredible thing. God works incredible blessings, and you see it, and you experience it, and you delight in it, and people respond to it. And then decades later, you look around and you go, well, where is everybody? And I'm not talking about the people who leave one church to go to another church. I'm not talking about the people who move away to another town or another city and they're being faithful at a faithful church. I'm talking about the people who leave church to go nowhere. When that happens, it's called rebellion. Rebellion. Rebellion is when you see and know and experience and delight in a great work of God, and then you turn your back on it. It happened in my church when I was growing it up. It happened in this church. It happens in churches all over the place. And in this passage, we see that it is what happened to the Jewish people. The Jewish people experienced the blessings of God, unmatched, unparalleled blessings of God. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 3 says, the Jews received the oracles of God. They heard the word of God, like God speaking they heard. In Romans chapter 9, verses 4 and 5, the apostle is trying to explain what the benefits are of being an Israelite. And he says, the Israelites to whom belong the adoption as sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises, whose are the fathers from whom is the Christ, according to the flesh, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. It's this mammoth list of blessings. What did the Jews get? They got the land, and they got the temple, and they got the promises, and they got the word, and they got the fathers, and they got the human lineage of Jesus Christ. They got all these blessings. And where are they? In Romans 
chapter 11, verse 17, the Jewish people are described as branches that were broken off because of their unbelief. They, they didn't believe. They received the blessings and they turned their back and they left. And you can't think that that was then and this is now or that was them and this is you. You can't think that. The Apostle Paul warns you right after he describes in Romans chapter 9 this this group of branches, the Jewish people that were broken off, he won't let you get the big head. They were broken off so that others could come in. The Jews were broken off so the Gentiles could come in. But he says in verse 18 of Romans 11, do not be arrogant toward the branches. Don't say, the Jews, (laughs) what a bunch of losers. They got all those gifts, they got all those blessings, they got all those graces, and they left, but I'd never do that. You better not say it. The Apostle Paul says, do not be arrogant toward the branches. But if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches are broken off so that I might be grafted in quite right. They were broken off for their unbelief. But you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. This is a parable about the Jews turning their back on the living God. But we dare not read it as though we couldn't turn our back on the living God as well. It's a story about salvation history, but it's a, it's a story giving a warning as well. It's a story giving a warning to you. The rebellion that happened in my youth group and the rebellion that happened at one time here in this church could happen again, and it could happen to you. The question that haunts me as I talk to you about this passage is if we took a picture of this room and we looked at it into the future all of the people who would rebel how do you know It wouldn't be you. How do you know that you're not one of the people in the picture that time will tell you weren't going to stick with it? You were going to turn your back on the living God. Well, here's the warning. Rebellion is really easy. It's an incredibly easy thing to do. Shockingly easy. That's the reason so many people do it. And so what I want to do from this passage for the next few moments is give you a roadmap for rebels. I want to show you what happens in the life and in the heart and the mind of a rebel so that you could diagnose it in your own heart and take a different path. Here's the first step on the very easy road to rebellion. Oh, it's so easy. Wait until you see it. All you got to do, if you want to be a rebel, is take what is God's and try to make it yours. That's it. It's so easy. This parable, as I said, is, is a short summary of salvation history. And the story is that the owner of the vineyard, plants a vineyard, and he builds walls and a tower, and he puts equipment in there and basins, and he does all of this work, and he hands it over to vine growers, to gardeners. And then he sends slaves to collect what's his, but they get killed. And then he sends more slaves to try again to collect what's his, and they get killed. 
And then he sends his son as the ultimate missionary to try and collect what is his, but he gets killed. And you know the way this works. You know the story. The owner of the vineyard is God. And the vineyard is his kingdom that he gives to his people, the vine growers, the Jews. And the slaves who come to collect his produce are the prophets that come to call the people back. And the son is Jesus Christ, who ultimately is executed by the very people that God had blessed by placing in the vineyard. Why did people who had received such blessing from such a gracious God, why did they behave so recklessly and ruthlessly and murderously and foolishly? Why did they do that? The passage says in verse 38, but when the vine growers saw the sun, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. Why did they do it? They want the gifts of God without God. That's what it means to be a sinner. That's not a Jewish problem. That's a human problem. What it means to be a sinner is that you want all the gifts and all the blessings that only God can give, but you don't want God. You want your life to be about you, and your crazed sinfulness is about trying to create a reality where that's happening. You want your life to be about the clothes that are on your back and the girlfriend that you've got or the boyfriend that you've got or the liquor that you like or the car or the money. You want your life to be about you and you want to push God out. You want to be in God's vineyard and pretend it's your vineyard. But that is never going to happen. All you have to do to be a rebel is make your life about your life. And you will become a rebel. We sang about this a few moments ago. All your blessings come that we may praise the name of Jesus. The most fundamental lesson about your life is that it's not about your life. Your life is about Jesus. Your life is about the living God. And if you recklessly, foolishly, wantonly persist in trying to take God's gifts without acknowledging Him, you will be a rebel and you will die. All you got to do is live for yourself. All you got to do is live for your own glory. All you got to do is be greedy instead of grateful. All you have to do to die is be really proud. And the Bible says that God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. You're going to be a rebellious face in the picture if you're living your life for yourself right now and refusing to live for the glory of God. It's so easy. Everybody does it. All you got to do if you want to be a rebel is take what's God's and try to make it yours. Second, all you got to do, super easy, is take what is clear and become blind. All you have to do is take a really clear, obvious word and close your eyes and stop up your ears and be blind. Look at Matthew chapter 21, verses 40 to 41 and be absolutely horrified at what you see. Jesus has told this story about a bunch of jerks who receive a glorious garden and they fight against God, they fight against his prophets, they fight against his son. He tells this story to the listeners. And in chapter 21, verse 40, he says, Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? And the vine growers answer. 
They said to him, he'll bring those wretches to a wretched end and will rent out the vineyard to other vine growers who will pay him the proceeds at their proper seasons. They just described the flow of redemptive history. The evil, murderous, wicked people are going to be tossed out to make room for other people. Their own words indict them. They say it. But then, in verse 43 and 45, Jesus springs the trap. In verse 43, he says, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing the fruit of it. Hey, guys, this is about you. I'm telling a story about you. In verse 45, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they understood that he was speaking about them and they sought to seize him. Their problem is they understand the truth in theory. They understand the truth when it's disconnected from them. But when it comes time to apply the truth to their own heart, they take what is obvious and they become blind. And you know somebody else who does this. We do this in church all the time. You, you pick the sin. You pick the teaching of the Word of God. It's so easy for us to take whatever teaching and agree with it in principle, but be completely stupid when it comes to putting it into our own heart. Gossip. Hate gossip. Gossip is a sin. Amen. Gossip is a sin. And then you get a great piece of information. You get a great piece of information and all you can do is look at it and think about it and you love it. And you have to give it to somebody else. So come here. We got to, I want to, I want to pray with you about something. <laughs> the principle sounds great until it's time for you to listen to it. We do this with sexual ethics. This world's going to pot. Everybody's having sex with everybody. Boys are having sex with boys. Women are having sex with women. Men and men are getting married. Women and women are getting married. This is destroying the nation. It's destroying society. It's destroying the church. But let's look at your internet history and see what you think about sexual ethics. Let's see who you are flirting with at work and see what you think. Let's see who's sneaking around under the parental radar to try to see how far they can get. Sinful sex is sinful until I want to have it. And then it doesn't seem so bad. Kindness. Oh, we got to be loving people. Jesus says, they'll know we're Christians by our love. That's the truth. I love that. That's great. Until you tick me off. <laughs> and then I'm going to light you up. What happened to kindness then? Uh, talk about that later. We are experts at applying the truth to everybody else and novices at applying it to our own hearts. And right now, some of you don't get this. Some of you in this room right now are side-eyeing somebody else in the room. I wonder if they're paying attention to this because they sure need it. <laughs> and I'm talking to you. You are the problem right now. That sideways glance, that wink-wink text that you just sent <coughs> that you're talking about somebody, you are the problem. You are on the road to being a rebel. One of the prophets that got killed for his preaching, Isaiah, 
says in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 20, you have seen many things, but you do not observe them. Your ears are open, but none hears. All you have to do, if you want to be a rebel, is listen to the word of God and apply it to somebody else. That is called spiritual blindness, and it'll kill you. All you got to do, this is so easy. You do this right on your own. You don't need anybody to train you or help you. All you got to do is take what's God's and try to make it yours. All you got to do is take what's clear and become blind. Finally, all you got to do, if you want to be a rebel, is take a message of salvation and make it one of judgment. This parable that Jesus tells is a message of love and salvation. God builds the vineyard because he loves his people. And he puts them in the vineyard that he made and that he built up because he loves them. And when they rebel, he sends his prophets to them because he loves them. And when they kill the prophets, he sends them more prophets because he loves them. And then he sends his son. He sends his son as the last ditch effort, as the full and ultimate example that this vineyard isn't about you. <laughs> And, and your life isn't about you. You're mine, and the vineyard is mine, and I have exclusive claim on your life, and you need to turn from living for yourself and turn and live for me. And when the sun comes, that's the ultimate demonstration that it's true. And people look at this, and they say, well, this is kind of a silly parable because no father would do this. No father would look at sending these servants who get executed one after another, after another, after another, after another, and then recklessly send his boy to go sort it out. So this is really kind of an unbelievable parable, really, except this is one of the few parables that Jesus gives where there's not one single made-up detail. Jesus gives parables to teach us about the kingdom of God, and he often makes up details on his way to a larger point. But this is one of the parables where he makes nothing up. Everything about the parable is true. You're blind if you don't see it. The parable is saying that the Father in heaven really did send his Son to people who he knew were going to kill him, and the Son really went. It is one of the greatest demonstrations of the love of God that you could ever imagine. Why would he do that? Why would he send his son knowing that he was going to die? Who does that? Well, it's a God who loves sinners. It's a God who wants you to be saved. It's a God who sends messengers and then more messengers and then more messengers until ultimately he sends the messenger to tell you that you don't have to fight against him. You don't have to be a rebel. You could return and you could be saved. And when that messenger Jesus comes, he lives a perfect life and he is executed. He's executed by sinful people who insist that my life has to be about my life. But that's part of the plan. Jesus changes the analogy in verse 42. He stops talking about himself as a son, and he stops talking about the Jews as vine growers, and he starts talking about himself as a stone. And he starts talking about the Jews as builders. And he starts talking about his kingdom as a structure, and the most important element in the structure is the capstone, the foundation stone. The most important stone is Jesus. Everything hangs on this stone. And that stone 
the builders reject. The builders reject the chief cornerstone, the most important stone, a glorious, beautiful, wonderful stone is rejected by people who ought to know better. But it says this came about from the Lord and it's marvelous in our eyes. This is a message of salvation. It is marvelous that the son, the stone who would be rejected and killed by the people who should have known better. It's glorious that that happens because then more are brought in. He becomes a global, worldwide, cosmic savior so that anyone, even today, you don't have to be a Jew. Anybody who would believe in him can be saved and it is marvelous in our eyes. It leads to the salvation of many. This is a message of salvation. The son comes to save. The stone comes to be the chief stone on which everything stands. God is giving a message of salvation, but if you want to be a rebel, all you have to do is reject it. It's so easy. All you have to do is hear that Jesus has come to live and die and rise for you. And all you have to do is not care. All you have to do is think that sounds stupid. All you have to do is say dead people don't rise from the grave. All you have to do is care more about your life than you care about the Son of God. And you'll be a rebel. Verse 44 says, he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. Jesus came to save you. But if you reject the salvation that Jesus offers in his infinite love, there is no hope for you. And Jesus Christ himself says, you will be grounded to powder and die. That's what happens to rebels. That's where they go. And it's so easy. All you got to do is make your life about your life. All you got to do is become blind when the truth is so clear. And all you got to do is look at a Savior who loves you and say, no, I want to do something else. I don't believe it. And you'll be a rebel. You know, the point of all this is that all of the blessings that we receive from the hand of God are a lot less important than how we respond to God. Do you know how many blessings you've had already today? So many blessings. You, you came to a church and, and many of you were in Sunday school an hour ago. And you were hearing the word be taught and you were shaking hands and hugging people and, and loving people who love you and they've got the love of Christ in their hearts and they're encouraging you and praying for you. And you came in here and we sang these songs and we prayed these prayers and we were loving on one another and hugging and talking and catching up. And we have been talking about the word of God. We've been talking about the God who loves you and sent his son to die for you. And we talked about how all you have to do is believe. You have been swimming all morning in an ocean of love and grace and mercy. And if you want to be a rebel, all you have to do is not care. All you have to do is think. All you have to do is be more excited about lunch When's he going to be done? I, I swear I don't care. I just, I just want to go to Cracker Barrel. That's, that's all you have to say. If that's where your heart is, I'm telling you, you're in trouble. I'm telling you, when, when you look at the picture in 30 years or 10 years or five months, and your face is one of the rebellious faces in the picture. It'll start in that disposition of your heart. Listen, 
I'm describing to you from this passage how to be a rebel, not because I want you to follow that path. I want you to recognize it and get off of it. I want you to see, I'm praying that you will see, I'm praying that God would explode in your heart and open your eyes and open your ears and that you would see that your life is about the great and glorious God, that you would see and worship and revel in the fact that everything you have from his hand is a glorious gift of love and grace. And it's not about you, it's about him. And I'm praying that you would open your heart to the word and believe it and listen and not know where everybody else is blowing it, but know where you're blowing it. And then you would look to Jesus Christ and know that every time you blow it, Jesus forgives you when you believe. And you'd want to be really close to Jesus. And you'd want to follow him all the days of your life. And you'd want to follow him all the days of your eternity. And that you'd never want to be a rebel away from such love. You can have it. And you can have it today when you believe in Jesus. And so let's stand and ask Jesus for his help. Jesus, Christ, protect your people. Keep us close. Guard us from rebellion. Guide us to great closeness with you today and next week and next year and forever. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.